I'll just put it there. Just... Okay, uh, good morning and, and welcome. Um, welcome also to our audience online as well as in the room. The title of this session, um, Surviving the Cost of Living Crisis, um, Positive Strategies for the Organic Supply Chain. Um, just want to briefly introduce our panel today. Uh, we have Pete Russell, uh, Andy Johnson, and Gareth Roberts. I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a moment, and they've got a, um, some opening thoughts to give you. We're going to want to run this today as a panel discussion and try and build in as much time as we can um, for discussion with you in the room and, and amongst us as well. Um, introduce myself. Um, John English Soil Association uh, recently joined them a month ago as a horticultural manager on Ben Raskin's team. Uh, before that, I was a grower um, with the community farm uh, box scheme close to Bristol. Um, currently, it's around 600 boxes a week. Although there's a story to tell there with the box numbers and the context of this discussion, and I kind of one of the reasons I was. Interest, interested to do this session is I've got kind of my own war stories to tell on what we've been through in 2022. Now, when the when the title of this session was proposed, I kind of really wanted a different, different title for it. I think we've all got a little bit of fatigue at the moment with the term cost of living crisis. It's everywhere we look in, in our media feeds, and really it needed flipping around in that the, the focus of this session is, you know, in the subtitle, it's positive strategies, uh, reasons to stay confident, reasons to stay hopeful. And that's what I really want to draw upon in the room today. I mean, we're only too aware that it's been a very challenging year for growers and everybody involved in food supply and you heard that already from, um, you know, from Tony's opening words and from Rebecca just now. Um, as producers, we're an industry with high cost of production, low margins, squeeze on prices. And when you come up against market situations like we have at the moment, you start to feel increasingly vulnerable. And, and Rebecca spoke well in her slide about horticulture and crisis. Um, yes, I'm sorry, another session with crisis in the title. I think we should probably be restricted to only one of our conference. Uh, on the customer side of things, um, I mean, the broad picture, and this is from latest Nielsen market survey data, is if you look at UK organics as a whole, it seems to be holding up relatively well. Um, in the food and drink sales, UK overall picture, again, this is from Nielsen, 2.3% down on year. Um, but organic holding its ground, you know, within that, it's it's less, it's a drop, but it's less of a drop. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that kind of market data now because the panelists have some of their own particular insights they want to bring with them today. If you are interested in that overall organic picture, I will signpost that there's an organic trade conference tomorrow afternoon. Um, hopefully the moderator can, can put a link in, in, in chat. Um, it's two hours, it's free to attend as well. And there will be some overall market insight there if that's what you're interested in. Um, well, where there is a kind of note of caution at the moment is um, some commentators starting to draw parallels about the 2008 recession, where veg consumption fell by 7 to 8 percent. There's interesting stuff out in the last couple of weeks by Veg Power, like the Food Foundation, amongst um, other stakeholders. Their new campaign simply veg is saying yes, their survey, their, their uh, market survey is showing that we're seeing the same thing now. And this is disproportionately affecting families earning less than £30,000 per year. Um, directly buying, eating less veg as a result of the current cost of living pressures. And those that remember that 2008 recession is what happened around then is big retail started to lose its nerve and organic started to be removed from shelves and was being delisted. 
um, as they switch to kind of lower price range strategies. Um, I think where we are now, there is some confidence that that may not happen again, but it's just to kind of say that the warning signs are there. Um, for us as organic producers, many of us, veg box schemes, short supply chains, we saw a big boom during the pandemic. And um, if you rewind back to January of 2022, uh, there was a session at the Oxford Real Farming Conference kind of reflecting in the title of the rather buoyant mood that we were feeling at the time, booking an ambulance who was part of that panel, a second coming of the box schemes with some cautious optimism at the time. Um, nine months down the line, uh, things are feeling quite a lot tougher. Uh, and, and I know that some, you know, may be looking at, you know, they working very hard to keep sales level in, some, you know, for some exposed to part of the markets where it's a little bit tougher, maybe looking at a year or two of managed decline. Um, so I'm going to, that's probably as much as I want to say now to set the context, um, and I'll pass across to our panel members. Um, what I've asked them to do is just prepare some opening thoughts and insights around really two broad themes. The first is, what is their sense of how things are now, October 2022? 20, and then looking to the immediate future, what are the things that we need to be focusing on to be resilient in the face of those pressures? And once, as I say, to be an open discussion, I'll kind of let each of uh, the panelists um, kind of give you their opening thoughts, and then we'll open it out to the whole room and the online chat as well for a discussion. Uh, Gareth. Thanks, John. I'm slightly afraid of the slide clip. Yeah, so, yeah. Try to make it work. Okay. Hi, I'm Gareth. That's me. Um, I just thought I'd introduce myself. John asked me to do that. So I'm basically a social entrepreneur uh, or cooperative entrepreneur based in Sheffield. Sort of background in cultural policy, arts administration. Um, I've, I've studied at a master's level, uh, PGCE, done a lot of lecturing. Um, but I found myself uh, basically co-founding a cooperative in, in Sheffield called Regather. Um, that sort of started off in 2005. Uh, turned into a co-op in 2010. Uh, I'm really passionate about food, uh, Lego. Uh, I've got four chickens in my back garden. I've got two children. They don't occupy the same space, but uh, may as well sometimes. And um, that's my email address. And if you want to get in touch, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, that's uh, the main regather building. Uh, it's, a, it's an old listed uh, works building. Um, it's smack bang in an area called Little Sheffield. Uh, that for us um, tells a, an amazing story of organised labour, uh, the role of food um, in, in you know, urban uh, development and city systems. Uh, but for us, it's, it's our kind of our home. Uh, it's, it's rented, we don't own it, um, you know, but it's, it's, it's where we want to be. Um, I'm sort of here exposing myself, you know, open to an audience you know, here and, and online. Um, we're not a panacea, you know, we're not going to fix it all on our own. We identify with a wider movement and by sharing, you know, what we are doing in Sheffield, um, maybe that will help us improve what we do and maybe that will help, you know, others learn about what we've done and maybe do that better elsewhere as well. So um, hopefully you can see where I'm coming from. It's, uh, it's quite something kind of laying self bare in front of an audience uh, sometimes. So. Uh, yeah, what is Regather? Well, we're a community food business. Um, there's uh, some quick bullets there as to exactly what we're about, what we do. Uh, our main building, Regather Works, uh, it's basically a food hub. Uh, I know that maybe not, you know, maybe doesn't mean a great deal. It's, it's a ubiquitous term that's used very widely. But for us, you know, there's a goods in, there's a process, and there's a goods out. And um, for us, that's all about our fruit and veg uh, uh, box scheme. Uh, we're serving around about 550, 600 households a week. Uh, we also have a, a bakery facility. And pre-COVID, um, it was a licensed venue uh, with a capacity of about 70 to 80 people, a bar, uh, and ticketed events up to five days of the week. Uh, we also would run quite significant events and festivals across the, the city and the region, but all of that uh, stopped with COVID and, and hasn't returned. 
but obviously replacing that, uh, we have seen significant growth in the box scheme. Uh, around our main building is the club garden. Um, it's basically an edible landscape. Uh, it's an urban green space, and it works as a fantastic interface between ourselves uh, and, and our community. It's also space where we've expanded. Um, we've built a couple of shipping containers and grow chambers, uh, which now serve as an aquaponics and hydroponic demonstrator uh, and a really significant apple pressing facility. Um, we've, we've taken eight tonnes of apples through a community harvest over the past uh, sort of six weeks, which as many of you will know, the, the apple harvest this year has been absolutely bumper. Um, we could have taken a lot more, but we had to put a stop to that. Uh, and then we have the Regather Farm, which is on the outskirts of the city. Uh, we have a, a, a polytunnels, uh, we, have, we have market garden beds uh, and, and huge plans. Uh, we're on a 20 year farm business tenancy with a 10 year option to extend. Uh, and, and we basically made that happen over the past few years. So, so that, that's kind of regather in, in a, a snapshot. So, um, yep, snapshot then. So October 22. So yeah, I mentioned significant growth in the box scheme, uh, but we have seen those figures uh, decline. Um, but still twice as many as pre-COVID uh, and people you know, are, are basically uh, spending a little bit more and people are still joining the scheme. Uh, but for us, you know, the key thing uh, was getting back into that kind of steady state of churn. You know, that, that is where we want our box scheme. That's where it was pre-COVID and that's the best position, you know, where you're sort of seeing people come and go naturally. They're not leaving for you know, the wrong reasons, um, but we are seeing a decline and that is definitely the cost of living having an impact on our, on our customer base. Um, I think the key thing for us is agility. So responding to those changes as they happen and, and really shortening the time frame of that uh, response uh, as, as much as possible. And that was hard when it was significant growth. Uh, it's even harder when it's a managed decline because you, know, you don't want to make people redundant, but we're seeing people you know, leave uh, naturally. Um, we're very good at engaging outside of the kind of retail offer, and we're still seeing that working ever so well. So whether that's pick your own flowers, uh, the apple donations are mentioned, uh, open days, and possibly you know returning back to events and festivals, yeah, we see that as an extension of what we do. That's incredibly important, and it's as popular as ever. Um, so yeah, key strengths that we talk, you know, always try and focus on and build on: brilliant word of mouth. You know, we, we want to be in people's homes every week being talked about, being shared, you know, verbally from trusted kind of peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, and, and ideally doing that, uh, not just online, but offline, you know, actually real people talking to one another. Uh, so we try and stimulate that wherever possible, um, making sure that we've got really great direct feedback with customers. And obviously a key strength for us is the short supply chain. So we have been to some extent resilient in some of the price increases because of our short supply chains. Uh, that reach into the immediate Sheffield area. Big challenges for us, logistics, so that last mile delivery, you know, the cost of running vans, the cost of finding replacements to running diesel vans, really problematic. Uh, we've just taken delivery of two new electric trikes. They were two years overdue uh, uh, through some really significant challenges in, in the supply chain uh, for those. But you know, we've waited and waited and they are finally here. But you know, that's the kind of issue we're dealing with is that sort of significant delays. It's all about infrastructure for us. You know, this has got to be the, the next sort of two to three years where we translate certain aspects of what we've kind of created into a much ex more extensive uh, infrastructure for local food. And um, yeah, the kind of opportunities we're looking at, working with the universities around research, uh, developing our community further. So we're a co-op offering membership. Uh, engaging with people through through ways of, of involving them in, in membership and governance and uh, sustainable food places and other examples of partnerships you know really important so just basically well beyond just the basic kind of fruit and veg offer um how am i doing for time still all right keep, keep going i used to lecture for a living so i could fill this space uh, <laughs> right so lateral learning um this is just kind of like something to highlight that I think is really important um, and certainly shapes what we're doing in Sheffield. And, and it's basically looking back at the past around the kind of, you know, what other disruptions have we seen uh, in the past that might help us learn how to you know, direct and, uh, and, and do what we need to do in the future. And for me, you know, my background in cultural policy 
uh, I think there's significant lessons still to be learned from the impact of digital technology on sort of music, film and television, uh, and particularly the kind of uh, policy responses that came out of the new Labour government in 97. And I know they're sort of, you know, they're just getting reworked on TV into short documentaries, but you know, actually Cool Britannia, Britpop, uh, the rise of the creative and digital sector, I, I think had, there's, there's huge amounts to be learned from that still. And I think you know, we need to be looking at uh, solutions that aren't just technical, but are socio-cultural as well. You know, we need to shape how people live and the kind of communities that they want to live in. And, and we're not going to do that by solely focusing on, on technical solutions. So I think there's lessons to be learned there. Um, I think B iterated quite a few of these points. We need more successful examples. We need significant local and regional vertical integration. You know, this isn't just about one or two examples of like farm shops or high value retail bricks and mortar. We've got to be looking end to end you know, around the supply chain uh, and, and how that looks to people and how that works. Uh, obviously, we could go into that a lot more, but I haven't got time. Um, we need sector specific industrial strategies. Uh, again, B, I think, put that together really, really you know, articulate that perfectly. Um, for us, our sort of theory of change is about increasing community wealth. You know, so if household income goes up, uh, then, then the right kind of food that we are producing is affordable. You know, and with that, we see uh, an increase in, in market share. So that, that's the kind of you know, direction of travel we need to be trying to look at here. This isn't about devaluing food or making food free uh, or, or just you know, pumping you know, industrial food uh, into the food system, whatever the cost. You know, we need to be looking at a, a positive virtuous circle uh, that's building up. And a part of that is around community building. So we talk about scaling out rather than up. Uh, so for us, that's about exploring opportunities like garden design services. So we're, we're enabling households that are our box customers to grow more of their own food. So there's more local food to go around a greater range of households, which kind of like, you know, might seem a bit crazy, you know, helping your customers grow their own food really want them to be buying what you're selling them. But actually, if there's more to go around, you've got more households doing the right thing. And that's how we're changing, you know, how people uh, operate. Uh, Involving people in composting and, and maybe even extending, uh, you know, to like home retrofitting. Uh, you know, for us, it's about collective action. So if we can get more people doing more of the good stuff. You know, lots of small is, is, is really important. Uh, so the future, um so yeah supermarkets are the dinosaurs will they evolve will they go extinct question mark um digital disruptors like amazon ricardo just eat um you know obviously they are the ones coming in um you know tech-led uh, venture equity backed um but you know you've got to ask the question why food and for them you know why not you know their model is based wow. on um you know, basically dis and reintermediating uh, you know, you know, flows of money uh, and goods and services. Uh, they don't really care what it is. Uh, if they can do it via a tech platform, they, they will do that sort of sector agnostic. Um, and, you know, if they can drive market share with that model or exploit market instability, you know, make sure that capital flows just like smash everything else out of the way, they will continue to do that. So we've got to be really aware of that. Uh, and, and, you know, with that comes this sort of new infrastructure for a quite a, what might seem quite a dystopian sort of food future, you know, because these are essentially tech platforms that deliver the wrong kind of food into people's homes. And you need to read George Monbiot's Regenesis for a little glimpse of what that looks like, sort of grey industrial glue uh, packaged up and delivered to people's homes. Um, OK, so, yeah, we can and must compete both online and offline. Uh, it's got to be values led, uh, you know, for us, that's all about local, seasonal, organic, cooperative. Uh, I mentioned about agility, really important, lots of small, a few big, but ready to adapt and adopt. And all about social innovation, uh, building the right kind of you know, good food communities. And for us in Sheffield, you know, that's very much about being part of sustainable food places and movements like uh, Land Workers Alliance and Sustain. Uh, I think, you know, this isn't all a kind of, you know, positive spin. There are some significant risks. So I mentioned like burnout, bust, buyout. You know, so we are seeing two years, two and a half years into, you know, the response to COVID, you know, people within our team having to deal with like quite significant, you know, physical or mental health problems. And so we've had to make, make you know, significant uh, improvements as to how we support our employees 
and actually engage in, in their you know, issues on a personal level. Um, and that's going to have to carry on into the future. Uh, yeah, economic viability, obviously incredibly important, but some sort of reassurance that it's not the only factor of success. Now there are other things that aren't just about, you know, the finances. Um, and the, the buyout kind of question, you know, what we've got to make sure is that we're ready for investors' pockets to become deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, these, the sums of money uh, that we're you know, seeing talked about, they've become increasingly meaningless. Uh, and, and, you know, these are the flows of global capital that are going to continue destabilizing markets and, and exploiting instability. And, uh, yeah, never forget, the only real crisis is capitalism. And don't forget that. So that's me. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, we'll save questions until after all three panelists have had a um, chance to do their presentations, if that's okay. Pass on to Andy. Shall I get the right button forward? So, um, I'm up from Devon. I'm Andy Johnson. I'm a freelance organic advisor. And it's, um, they've all seemed to have fallen off, don't they? There we go. But better that way. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. It was um, very inspiring. To, you're the actual maker in the room. You're, you're growing things. I used to be a farmer. Um, now I advise farmers on how to do their job and sell their crops better. Um, so where are we with this thing? Let's hope that one looks a bit better. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've heard it earlier on. Sales are falling of organic produce. Um, we know uh, this. There was a report came out from AHDB last week uh, saying that sales fell 16% in fresh food in the second quarter of this year of organic, which is alarming. But that is going to be supermarket sales. It won't include small box schemes. They're not looking at you, they're counting the big guys. And it's also part of a narrative that come recession time, savvy shoppers go and save money, they stop spending on organic. So if you have stopped spending on organic and you read a headline like that, you think, oh, it's not so bad, everyone's doing it. And it's about, you know, we've got a counter argument to that, I hope. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to ask why, just as in the energy prices, uh, does the price of the dirty, so dirty gas sets the price of clean electricity and dirty vegetables, are setting the price for organic and pushing the price, you know, the sales of organic down. And it doesn't have to be linked, doesn't have to be direct. So I won't dwell too long on the left hand side. We know where we were in 2020, organic home delivery was booming, huge uplift in growing, unlocks and lockdowns led to people sticking with the home delivery service that they got. Um, lots of growers made late decisions to plant a bit more got away with it because they sold more boxes in that following year um, and investment and recruitment was put in place to cope bigger fridges more vans more people because uh, it was hard um, yeah as i say growers responded planted a bit more this year if you planted a bit more you might be worried about not selling it all and i'd suggest that changing your business model and being very flexible on um, is where you need to be. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm imagining that there are potential surf surpluses out there. The, the three the growers I'm working with all have, you know, surplus crops coming in now and, and later on through the winter if their box sales don't pick up. Um, but rather than making the worst decisions, I hope that um, you know you can have you. You can have some confidence that it will get better. So, how are retailers and shoppers reacting? So, um, retailers are focusing on things like the staples. So, they're all fighting each other on price eggs, milk, bread. They all drive the footfall and they're spending a lot of advertising to tell people that they're all matched and that their quality is better than the other guys. Um, and by the word support, I, they are investing 
put the money to it, they're losing money, making lower margins on those staples, uh, which means that other items in the store have to go up in price to support those items. And sooner or later, they're going to start to run out of items that they can be making money on. Um, so it's, uh, and, and it doesn't bode well. I think as um, Gareth mentioned there, you know, maybe organic produce being over expensive. A, they're going to try and make a bit more profit than that um, until they can't, and then they'll delist and see that um, the amount of organic they're stocking reduced. But they are working hard, I have to say. Um, you know, they're making products smaller, uh, cheaper ingredients, and shoppers in turn are um, rewarding the retailers by <laughs> following the deals uh, from store to store, to store, buying the smaller packs uh, to stretch their squeeze grocery budgets. Um, and between everybody, between the shoppers and the, and the retailers, we saw, I think, August food inflation was 4.4%, uh, where the overall rate was 9.9%. So by doing all of this, they managed, you know, inflation in food was lower than the general headline rate. Um, but people use different shops for different things. So, and the club card data is very useful. They know that you buy pet food once a month. So just before you get your paycheck, if you're going to come back in their store, they'll bombard you with lower offers that, you know, their carrots are cheaper as well. And you'll go and buy your cat food. And they've got you for another month spending quite a big ticket with them. But by the same token, shoppers also use their local veg box for one thing, and then they'll go to the supermarket and top up the loo roll and all the nasty things in life. And that you are part of the landscape um, of people shopping around. Uh, and also there's less impulse spending going on. Uh, and, and I've even read that people are using cash again so that they can limit their spending to 80 quid a week, just like the good old days. So I'd say margins on food are, are low at the moment, supermarket wise, and that's not good. Uh, that they're going to try and make their margins elsewhere, and that could be on the non-staple veg, like organic. So I've done a bit of research, if you like numbers. Uh, don't look at the, well, each one will tell a story, each one of these, these lines. So I looked at the DEFRA prices, um, they publish them every week, forever. Um, they don't mean too much, you take them all with a bit of salt, but they do show the trend. Um, so prices are up, aside from the apples, last year was a bump, um, a light crop for apples. This year, is, uh, as you said, it's a bumper year for apples and the price has fallen, but everything else is in shorter supply than it was a year ago. Um, and if you think of these eight items as one veg box, as, you know, the ingredients for a bumper large veg box, a few more carrots and broccoli in there. Uh, last year, your ingredients would have cost, and it's not organic. This, these are the prices that a restaurant would go to pay at the market. So the farmer gets less than these. So last year, the prices were terrible, <laughs> um, which is why there's a bit less on the market, I think. Um, but yeah, the ingredients cost about 53% across that basket of goods. Um, so caterers and, and, and independent retailers, this is where they go and buy their stuff from the markets and the wholesalers. Um, and I did hear last week that um, cauliflower and Holland, large collars are making two and a half euros a head in the marketplace. But then in the supermarket, they're paying, <laughs> you'd be better off going to the supermarket to go and buy your cauliflower than you would to the market in the Holland. And that indicates that something isn't quite right, I think. Um, so I put the market prices over there on the right from the, from the previous page. Um, all the green ones show where the retail sell, selling price is greater than the wholesale equivalent. And, and these are all from the same week, different websites and um, the different numbers. Um, while the, the blank ones, basically they're selling them, selling food retail at lower than the cost of wholesale. So someone is losing money, but who is losing money? I, I don't actually know. Uh, I suspect the retailers are losing a bit of money selling food. Um, but if it's farmers, um, they need to limit loss-making sales, and they will 
you know, you've got a contract with you to sell your carrots to a packer at a price agreed a year ago by the packer, and you agreed to grow supply the packer. But if you see that the wholesale market is offering more than you'll get from your packer, some of your product will make its way into the other market, and the packer won't get as many carrots as they hoped. Uh, if it's the packers losing money, they need to look for other markets aside from the supermarket contracts. Uh, and there will be losers. It's always the middle people that seem to get squeezed in these, um, you know, when money does go very short. But then obviously the farmers that are owed money by the packer then carry the debt and get tuppence in the pound. So farmers will be, you know, carrying a lot of the risk for this. Um, and if it's retailers and they're losing money and their shareholders stop supporting them in that, they'll have to put their prices up. Um, and it could be that a retailer fails. We know there's more retailer space in this country than we need. And this could be the year when we lose a store or two. And yes, it's funny, but you know, in some towns, one store dominates the landscape. And if they disappeared, where would people buy their food? So, you know, this is going to be an issue. Um, and I just said, you know, at the end of that one, security just, you know, it's not about defence spending. It's not all about defence spending. It's about keeping people fed. So the market is higher than it for wholesale and its retail. And that says, you maybe could supply some of your surplus food into the um, in, into that wholesale market. So that's those prices are what restaurant would be paying to have cauliflower. If you've got cauliflower and you can afford to sell it at the same price, um, why wouldn't they buy from you if your service is better? So I'd say this winter is, um, we we'll break it down into three bits. Um, in the near term, I'd say up to Christmas, uh, it's more of the same, I'm afraid. Organic sales are gonna to appear to be dipping. Um, organic will be expensive. Retailers are going to be harping on about how cheap they are, um, especially on the budget lines. But at the same time, all fresh food is becoming expensive. Um, but they were, and yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that last. Um, and but later on, so the middle part of the winter, Christmas and onwards, I think gaps will start to emerge on the shelves. Um, and one of the reasons why organic did so well at the beginning of COVID was that the last stuff left on the shelf was, was the organic one. And every unit of flour sold or spaghetti. Or, um, and they came to box schemes on their doorstep. People, you know, shoppers looking for delivery slots. Um, and they found they got a nice secure delivery of fresh organic veg on their doorstep. Um, that, that need for security of supply may come back after Christmas, particularly, um, as I say, if the shelves start to empty of the things that people really want to buy. Uh, as spring arrives, I think it could be messy if we've got retailers and packets folding. Um, but I do think you can find a market for your stuff if, if you've got it. Um, so the strategy I would recommend is um, if you have surpluses, if you don't have surpluses, that's fine. You can afford to put your price up. Um, if you've got surplus, how much do you have? What do you have? Um, what do you need to keep back for your own sales for your veg boxes through the winter? Uh, is there something you can swap? If there's something you've got a lot of that the market's hungry for, maybe use a bit less of that in the box scheme. Um, you know, find out what people want. Identify customers. So the ones on your route, take, you know, go for the low-hanging fruit, the pubs, cafes, farm shops, green roses, wholesales. Wholesalers, even butchers, um, will be selling. You know, could could be a, a place to sell your veg. Um, get yourself some marketing materials aimed at the wholesale market. Um, go out and meet them. And pick your moments. Visit a chef before service, not during service, for instance. Uh, and it's really good if you're going to go and sell your beer. Walk into a, a restaurant with a bag of stuff and start unloading it one by one and you will get customers because they really do like to meet the practitioners. Um, if you do take on, if your wholesaling is new to you, make sure you only have one channel of communication. 
not a combination of telephone, WhatsApp, email, website. Um, one channel so that the orders come in and don't get lost. The order gets processed, the invoice is right. All those things have to be right. Set your price fairly, um, and the chef won't always tell you what they're paying. So be ready with the price when you walk in the door, be ready to change it, come up if you like. Uh, and if your portfolio doesn't fit, don't worry. A clever chef will stretch a menu to save money and move on if you need a brick wall. If you drop the idea in their head and they know how to get hold of you again, the penny might drop later on in the winter if veg becomes scarce. Um, so I think we will see veg boxes sales rising and it's half term next week and we're going to um, probably take the last dip and then hopefully the rise all the way to Christmas. Because um, I think people will want security of supply. Um, and I think import prices can only get higher and import difficulties can only get higher. Um, get to know a good wholesaler or two because maybe you don't have to reinvent the wheel and set up your own wholesale network. But find a wholesaler on your doorstep who visits all these places all the time. They handle the sale and they handle the risk of the debt as well. So, you know, don't forget, if you're taking on new customers, you might be liable for some debt if the restaurant closes. Um, and wider than that, beyond the winter, really, more collaboration has been called for this morning. Um, can only help give small growers economies of scale without having to grow their businesses. Uh, buying group, setting up buying groups. It strikes me that the box scheme market is made up of lots of little businesses that don't necessarily compete in the same geography. Um, sharing the purchase of packaging of imports, um, even plant um, transplants, collectively buying, sharing pallets of, of, of um, plants can save an awful lot of money, but also media wow. content. So things like videos, to, you know, how do you use a rubber nest goat, how is it grown? Those sorts of things cost money and, and, and they put social media, they do sell product. Joining though, you know, joining up the five other box schemes to make one video a month to plan through the, you know, it doesn't, all, doesn't always have to be yours, but it's it's someone making a scenario nard. Um, and you've got, you know, you've shared a tenth of the cost or a fifth of the cost. Um, join up with other box schemes. There's too many of us and it's too, fractured and in summary stay positive um, things could get worse the tide could carry on going out before the tide comes back in as i say but i hope you can find markets for your product keep your values at the forefront of the offer including the obvious ones local fresh reliable good value and all the time it's organic um, and I think you can also, it's time to define yourself by what you're not as well. You're GM free, there's less packaging, it's better value, shorter food chains, emphasize the wrongness of the other system and criticize the system, but not the person who then has to end up buying the cheaper food. Um, I'm gonna agree with everybody. None of us are innocent. The world is going to hell in a handcart and be nice to each other. Good luck. Thank you, Andy. Hello, um, I'm Pete, and I uh, set up UBI. It's an acronym for Out of Our Own Backyards. Um, in 2008, actually, and have been on this journey from New Zealand. I'm originally from Australia. Seven generations ago, I was kicked out of England, but clawed my way back about three years ago. So, um, but yeah, I've been in this game for a while and um, we're now really working on helping horticulture, small scale sort of market gardens be able to go direct to market. So Ubi is a it's software that allows you to sell directed to households and, and local businesses. Um, I've got a bunch of slides, but oh, there's one more. So here we go. There we go, there, stay positive. Um, but I, I figure probably, you know, it's going to take a while to go through them. We don't, it'd be good to be able to get onto questions. 
Uh, so just basically the insights that in, in very quick summary that we've noticed from what we're doing is there are around 40 box schemes uh, around the UK that are running on the UBI platform. And um, so we did our own survey with those box schemes to ask how are you experiencing the cost of living crisis? And we did it just a few days ago or just over a week ago to get a feel for where people are at right now. Um, and the general sentiment is it's, it's not too bad yet, right? We had August, July, August, which is obviously a big dip with, with some holidays and everyone going away because they could this year. Uh, but the bounce back up at the in, in September has been as good as any other year. Um, and in some cases, it's been better. Uh, I think that one of the big contributing factors is that supermarkets and all the narrative out there is that prices are going up and up and up. But most of the box schemes on Ubi are farms that are selling direct and they haven't put their prices up. And people appreciate that. And so they're sticking around. And I think there's a point now where food prices are going up uh, and to, you know, organic is usually seen as a premium price. Uh, but general food prices are going up. And so if, if as a grower, you're able to deal direct to the market, direct into households and so forth, and you can hold your price because your costs aren't necessarily being affected by fertilizers and long supply chain costs, then the prices are going to get closer and closer to parity with conventional food. And so there's a real advantage there for you to be able to just hold your price, not follow the market, but work on a cost plus pricing basis. So you're maintaining good margin but I think there's a real opportunity at the moment for you to be able to actually, for the first time, be really price competitive just by just by holding. And I think that's what's that's what's bearing out is that people are really appreciating that. Oh, if I go and I shop with my direct with my local farmer, and as long as the experience is convenient enough, and I can I can do it on my phone or I can do it on my computer the way I would if I was dealing with Ocado or whatever, that that people will stick. And they love the idea of the food security. They love feeling like, oh, I'm connected with my fourth source of food. I kind of know who's there and where it's coming from. So I think that, you know, whilst, yes, it's definitely, you know, apocalyptic times in, in the general scene of things, that actually smaller scale, direct to market uh, is in a better position than most to be able to weather this and to be able to start to use this as a way of reclaiming market share. Um, and so that's the, the general sentiment that, that we've been getting. I'll very quickly flick through these, these slides. Da -da -da. Okay, All right, there we go, the other button. Okay, so this one here is basically saying how are sales compared to what you would expect for this time of year? Um, six, have we had another, another question was higher, same or lower. So six have said the same and eight have said lower, but not a lot. In the comments, it was like just marginally lower. Um, you know, are your customers telling you they're being affected by the cost of living? Some, very few, and none at all. It's not really something that, because they're communicating with their customers all the time. It's not actually really a major factor uh, yet, yet. Um, you know, will you, be, will you be putting your prices up? Have you or will you be putting your prices up? We did recently, so there was three that have recently put their prices up. There are five that have saying that they will soon, but then there are six that are saying they haven't and they don't plan to. And I've, I've, my question around this is, you know, if we will soon, why will you? Is it because your costs are going up and you're following your costs or is it because, well, the market's paying more, so might as well make, you know, hey, while well, the sun shines. And my question around that is, is that, is that you know, medium long term a, a better strategy if you, if you, as long as you've got decent margin? Um, and here we can see, you know, how are you doing your pricing? Cost plus pricing, one person, one, one, one other said, yeah, we're doing cost price. Following the market, five have said that, and both eight have said that. And, I, and what this shows me is that there is a real tendency to just follow the market here. But by not, you know, what do they call it? By zigging when you could, when everyone's zagging or whatever, there's a chance to be able to actually, um, you know, get a, get a better result out of the circumstances we're in. And um, pricing, everyone's saying, you know, that people feel like the customers feel like the pricing is about right. Um, 
Whereas in the past, having done, you know, organic box schemes for 12 plus years, uh, it's usually understood that the pricing is expensive, but it's worth it. Um, this is an opportunity for the pricing to be not only about right, but saying to be like, yeah, this is great. Okay, and then this is uh, just a food and drink report that just came out. Interesting insights there are that uh, the cost of living prices would, you know, 24% of people would accept price rises if it means there's an increase in quality. So there is an opportunity there to say, all right, we have got higher quality. We don't have to drop our prices. People will expect, you know, good. We'll, we'll pay that bit more as long as the quality is there. So again, keep your quality and, and, and hold the price where it is and you should be able to um, attract the market. Uh, this one here I noticed was interesting that purchases from butchers and farm shops have waned down to 19% from 26% last year. And, um, but at the same time, one third of people see local businesses as important to support. Uh, I've got a feeling that that waning of, of butchers and, and farm shops, a lot of that has been the big shift into online. Can't, you know, I don't, I don't, can't really substantiate that, but my, my gut is that there is such a big move into the online space that that's where those, those businesses have an opportunity to be able to regather, re regain uh, some market share by making sure they've got a presence there. Um, and, but people's trust in the big, you know, the big brands and what they're saying about sustainability is pretty much low. It's, a, it's a very low. Um, they don't believe them. So again, it's an opportunity. People will believe you because you are the real deal. And it's, I think it comes down to making sure that you're delivering a good quality product, making sure that you're not, you're not using this circumstance to be able to push margins up, even though you probably deserve to. But if you can just hold, hold your ground uh, and making sure that you're available and accessible, that people can find you easily. I think they are really important aspects to, to focus on at the moment. And then the messaging is, there's a real key message now that we have an opportunity to put out there, and that is you're going to get your best value for money from buying direct from your local farmers. That's where the best value for money is. And if, if you can make that direct link uh, available to your, your region and that message can really start to be putting out there, then I think we'll find that this is actually potentially a positive, a positive time for you. So I know it's sort of against the, the general narrative, but that's the insights that, that we've gained. Um, so yeah, I think we'd better get on to question time. We should. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take questions from the room if anybody has. We'll kick things off with something from the online if there is anything. Tony? Uh, yeah, nothing yet from the online. So I'm going to encourage, just about to encourage the online community to post their thoughts and questions. Right, so. Okay. I mean, I, I, um, I had a follow-up question around, we, uh, I can't remember which three of you mentioned um, the cost of the last mile. I think it was Gareth. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and Pete talking just now about direct to customer and people coming on farm to buy. So a model that has been vulnerable as we have been to fuel price increases. And that situation has got better in the last month or two, but was a particular pinch in the summer. I mean, does this, what's your sense of that? Does this feel like a vulnerability if, if fuel price is staying high and we're having to um, adjust a business model that's built on, you know, every customer that you deliver to, you're having to use diesel for that last mile? So. Yeah, I don't know if this mic is working. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, well, there's a couple of things. Firstly, when you are delivering within a certain space, distance, it is a short distance to, to deliver relative to a lot of long scale, a long, long distance supply chain. So your cost is, is kept to a, a, a minimum that way. But the other part is that people don't mind paying delivery fees. They understand that you know, it costs money to get it from the farm to their house. And so if you set your delivery fees commensurate with your cost of doing deliveries, then it's a zero sum game. It, 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 and, and people tend to not be put off by that. Yeah, we, we do have a, I think that's picking up. We do have a, a delivery charge 
uh, structure based on where people live. Um, but we also sort of try and share the, the burden of that last mile. So we set up collection points that allows the customer to maybe fit in um, uh, the collection of their box with existing sort of, you know, travel patterns. Uh, a couple of years ago, when things were a bit uh, sort of less uh, complicated, um, we did invest in some student-led projects, looking at uh, lockers uh, and mm. situating lockers in uh, transport hubs. And you know, I think that's still a, a really viable idea. Um, obviously, Amazon, uh, another you know uh, big uh, sort of logistics providers, they are seeing lockers as a a part of their solution, but the, the challenge obviously is putting a perishable food stuff in a metal box that maybe then needs either refrigeration or shading, definitely needs security um, and so on. But yeah, there's, I think, ways of innovating around that. I mean, the, we, we were waiting on these electric trikes for, for a long time, I mentioned, and they're going to make a big difference. They will definitely take one of our diesel vans off the road. Um, we'd love to run an electric fleet. But the cost of purchase or, or even higher purchase, plus the logistics of charging um, those vehicles is really complicated and very costly. And even though it sounds like a great idea, once you've got you know, several vehicles on the road that are going out five days of the week, charging them actually in the current situation you know, isn't viable. Um, certainly not in Sheffield anyway. Well, I mean, the one, the one thing that we said about the veg box market is it's um, it's all about, should be all about good value, really, because by surrendering control of what my choice, I hand it over to you, the farmer, and for you send me £25 worth of veg for 18 and that was always the deal, and a lot of customers, you know, the hardcore customers, I was talking to a box scheme um, a couple of weeks ago and they were saying that they took on all, lots of new customers during the COVID time and they've gone but they've le they're left with the hardcore customers the ones that were converted to organic box schemes years ago um, and you know quite sad now that actually we didn't get to know those new people when we had them in with us but we didn't manage to convert them to stick with this for the next couple of years and i think converting customers is for box schemes is that's part of the job converting land is number one obviously for organic but then converting customers so that when they meet courgettes for the third season and they've got nine different recipes for courgettes to get through a whole season i think they really made a customer there and they'll stick with you forever and but i that value thing might have you know it might become something that the, the box market can can claim again in the new year when the, I think the price of all vegetables is going to have to rise the non-organic this price support by supermarkets can't last um, so I I think by the spring or get, or get your organic box schemes that haven't put the prices up will start to look cheaper again Ooh. but I think it's up to you the box scheme to tell the public about that and the press because maybe no one will expect to hear that story so some marketing needed. Can I chip in there? Sure. Oh, unless there's some questions. Uh, you have the microphone, please. Um, I just wondered if the panel, probably Gareth, um, but the panel in general had a um, thoughts on sliding scale and whether that would work for bigger box schemes. Obviously, there's been a few CSAs at the moment. We're looking at doing it for our CSA. But I'm just kind of wondering if you see it working on some of the bigger scale that you guys are talking about. It's an art to live in crisis. By, by sliding scale, do you mean um, price in accordance with ability to pay? So that sort of thing, yeah. So pay what you feel and, uh, or not pay what you feel, but on the yeah, ability to pay and, and some like lower income customers. Actually, before the mic goes, could you just give us your name and... and, and yeah, work? my name's Tim Dickens, um, and we run a small CSA in Devon called Teen Greens. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so we've, we've certainly had inquiries from um, you know, new customers who want to join the scheme. Um, we've got 
organizations in the city that uh, redistribute surplus food coming out of the supermarket food system and they operate pay what you can pay what you feel you know pricing structures so there's a certain comparison with those as opportunities to feed a household with our box scheme um, where that prompts people to ask you know can you do something on a pay as you can pay what you feel basis um, obviously the economics are, of the two systems are very different and they occupy very different parts of the overall food system so we'd be careful about certainly opening up any kind of you know pay what you can pay what you feel type um, offer uh, we're, we're always diverting anything that's still edible but isn't sellable into those you know, parts of the, the food system and, and supporting them wherever we can. Um, we've not implemented anything that would create a, a, a sort of you know, pay it forward type um, offer. I think you know, the, the transaction that you're asking people to make there is you know is is a yeah it's complicated um so yeah we've certainly had a couple of inquiries but i think from our point of view there would be issues about you know let's say there was a, a, a sort of an aggregation of um free boxes you know that were created by our existing customer base how we would then choose where that went subsequently is actually almost that's a, that's a harder thing to do than aggregating that as a as a resource within the, the local food system um because then you you know, as a, you're making decisions about who has what and 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 how um so yeah really complicated in the background you know we have a local authority and a, and a public health team and, and a cost of living crisis that's been around way 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 before uh, the rhetoric has, has sort of you know done what it's done more recently so, you know, this is nothing new uh, to a significant proportion of the population of Sheffield, uh, which is the sad truth. You know, these are structural issues um, that, that we're facing. So the, the, you know, the reality is that it would be a drop in the ocean that would create a huge amount of complication for us. And a much better way of addressing that is a sort of cash first policy around the kind of welfare uh, support that's actually available through social and, and, and health care channels and, and the welfare system uh, and enabling household income to increase. Yeah, otherwise, it just becomes a sort of gesture politics of like, you know, transactional, you know, people who have the wealth can like suddenly decide that someone eats that week. And that's, that's not a solution. Yeah, and I also think it depends how you ask the question. I've got um, a friend who running a restaurant I think put it out, it was basically pay what you feel. Um, and that wasn't raising enough money. And they changed the question to recommended price. And suddenly the average spend in a restaurant went up. So if you if you leave it to people without any guidance whatsoever, people might go, well, I could make quid for that. Actually, it was a 20 pound meal. Um, you know, if if you point out is a if you put recommendations, you know, around 15 pounds. People who can afford more than 15 will put in 18 and people who can't will put in 12 and you're out so it I, i'd read some psychological papers <laughs> about how to ask that question because it's quite important to get it right but it is a poverty issue right now it's not cost of living crisis it's a poverty crisis for an awful lot of people and i'm not sure we've got all the answers but you know th there's a commitment from this movement from the oga and others to you know, to feed everyone with good food, not just the wealthy and the well-informed. And I think once, once politicians understand that, they will start to support, to support it, I hope. Yeah. And just quickly on that, um, there are four, three or four CSAs and hubs that we work with that do have a sliding scale model um, where it's, uh, you know, you get to choose. So uh, do I want to buy the, the the expensive one or do I want to buy the cheap one? Um, and it's a self-selection. And But the amount of lower cost boxes that are available depend, depends on how many people buy the higher cost boxes. 
Um, I think as long as you've got clear guide rails on that, then it has been working. And I think, I'm not sure if Lawrence is here from Soul Farm. Where are you? Hey, Lawrence, how are you going? Lawrence up there will be able to tell you exactly what he uh, what he's experienced with that. Can we bring that in, Lawrence? Do you want to say something? Hey, Tim. Um, yeah, we, we, we do the sliding scale. Um, and uh, we've actually seen the increase in low income boxes um, over the last year versus next year. Um, and we had to market it sold out actually because we were sort of doing too, too many. It's all self-selecting. We don't ask any questions really. Um, in terms of like the uh, poverty side of things, uh, we used to give away free boxes as well. Um, and uh, we've actually decided this, this year we took a pause on that because we didn't feel like we were adequately doing it for the same reasons I think that were sort of mentioned and we're doing a much bigger piece um, on how we're going to kind of do that, how we're going to um, give give away free food and we're working with a couple of uh, food banks to sort of do that. I think there's a big body of work that needs to be done on what goes into that box, how um, what food we put in it because a lot of people living in travel lodges, do they have ovens? Um, what food can they cook that is um, uh, raw um, or, or like cooked through a microwave or a very simple um, hob? And so my feeling is um, like the low income boxes are self selecting if people can pay a little bit towards it, then, then that's great. But in terms of the free kind of side of things, working with food banks and Identifying the right people is is a huge challenge, as as has been mentioned. Um, yeah, thank you. Could, could could I just ask a question, building on something that was sure mentioned? Yeah, go ahead. Um, we we were um, just building on the uh, thing that was said about choice. Um, my gut feeling at the moment is that um, uh, people are some people are continuing with veg boxes and that seems to be going fairly steady as, as Pete mentioned, but we also run a farmer's market, which has just been growing and growing and growing um, this last year. And so my conclusion out of that is that maybe people are deciding um, to uh, plan what they're eating and then going out and getting that veg in order to make that meal, as opposed to receiving the veg and then um, cooking. Um, which is possibly a way of kind of saving money. A very anecdotal kind of thought, but does anybody have any feelings on that kind of hat shift? I mean, I can, um, I said earlier I was a grower in the community farm box scheme. I, we suffered a really dramatic drop in sales over 2022, having had, I think, I think the boom was higher and the and the slide down the slope afterwards in the Bristol market for whatever reason, you know, all areas are different. And I think it was a lot of exactly what you're saying. Um, it, it wasn't the whole reason in that uh, I mean, we were up to a thousand boxes during pandemic as opposed to about, you know, middle, you know, middle 600 before after a price increase around the week that Putin invaded Ukraine, that timing really sucked, I have to say, in hindsight. Um, we had an immediate drop, but it carried on happening through April, May, June of this year. And I think a lot of it was perhaps not losing people to organic because we thought we understood our customers and what they were doing. But it's, um, I think a light bulb's gone on. Exactly what you were saying was going on. People were making the choice about where they're going to spend you know, to plan meals. Um, and I think this is, you know, I think at the people that we've spoken a lot about box schemes, the people that are involved in them, I think perhaps have to recognise that. And it was, you know, Gareth was talking about diversity, you know, the more routes you can find for people to find you and what you do, the better. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've, we've built a lot of our marketing on a sort of trust versus choice. Um, and we, and we, we do try and articulate that uh, wherever possible and that's built on some robust research that we did with the university a few years ago um, we offered a tower block five pounds a week uh, for a year each household about 50 households and they could redeem that through a bag or box scheme or they could go to a 
uh, green grocers at the city centre market and, and nearly all the households went to the city centre market because that's what they've always been doing anyway. Uh, and, it, and it led us to really understand this, uh, you know, at a household level, the, the, the issue around, you know, maintaining particular habits, uh, having choice from a selection of food items is obviously really important, which leaves, you know, bag and box schemes in a position where you've, you've got to build trust uh, to replace the loss of choice. Um, so that's what our marketing is really based on uh, and making sure that you know, we're offering recipes uh, and that we're, you know, we have one indicator of, of, of a, an issue is the number of dislikes. So we, we allow our customers to specify up to, well, it used to be up to three, but we had to increase it up to four, um, which for a, you know, a box scheme packing line is actually quite a big deal um, when you're saying, oh, goodness me, you know, we've got to swap something out. Now, I think there are some better digital solutions out there that we're seeing um, that are of interest that allow that process to be streamlined. Um, so, yeah, but, but anecdotally, because that's what we often have to go on, customers are interested in a wider range of choice over necessarily leaving that entirely up to us and trusting us to do it. I think there's like more factors outside of our control that they're aware of that dictate what's in their box, basically. So, yeah, tricky. Uh, I'll, I could take the question from Tony online and then we'll come back. Uh, yeah, thank you. A uh, question online from Charlotte Barry, CSA Network UK. What is the source of the data, please, on the conscientious shopper, et cetera? Ah, the source of the data is the food and drink report. Um, let me see if this I can I can share that with whoever can get that message out, but it's a recent recent report that's just been released. Um, and I think I shared it with, with you, Phil, but I can't I don't recall the, the, the URL. Yeah, thank you. There's a question down here. Yeah, have the microphone down the front, please. Hi, I'm Fred. And um, there's a lot of focus on box key. I do wholesale. I do four boxes. <laughs> but the biggest increase I've seen is I get people on the farm. I do, I call it pig and pig. Yeah. And I've done it for the last four years. People come to the farm, Wednesday, 10 to 12, Saturday, 10 to 12. Sunday is happening as well now. People come to the farm, harvest their own vegetables, as much or as little as they want. Uh, they got choice. And it is increasing and increasing. Word on mouth. Uh, some Saturdays, 300 pounds. Uh, last, I do an honesty stall as well on the stall, uh, sorry, on the farm. So I bring people to the farm. I got no packaging, no labor, and they come away, they weigh their own vegetables, leave the money or do bank transfer. And it's just, it's perfect. Last year we did six, well, just me, we did 16,000 pounds just on pick your own and the honesty stall. And that's not including wholesale or any other outlets, but it's, we're focusing a lot on box schemes and there are other ways of uh, creating revenues and no cost on, on the pick and dig. And people love it. Once you've hooked them, they keep coming back. They're bringing kids, they're bringing neighbors, they're coming with families and that's a low cost pro choice. You know, I'm always say to people, if you want one potato, one carrot, fine. I'm happy with that. And um, yeah, that, that's another option farmers should uh, explore. You have to train them. You know, when they're when new, you show them around, let them taste the tomatoes and the, uh, the apples, everything. But once they're in, they keep coming and they know where to go, what to do. You don't have to be there. You can do your own thing. Wow. <laughs> Trust. Yeah, they educate yeah, They sign up. No, they don't sign up. They just turn up. You got the sign post. It's sometimes you put up a flag where the bees are the best, and then the kids start running around. Yeah. Have a little bit trouble with spot. But yeah, they find it and they taste it and they, they love it. That's great. A uh, question at the back. Oh, oh sorry. You want down? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so Ulrich, I'm sharing the next question. Uh, I wanted to 
to go a little bit on this question you mentioned, Gerd, in terms of economic of scope or you know scaling out, you said, you know, what in terms of I, consumer, this is a question. What are asking at the moment on on this idea of economics of scope in terms of, because basically box schemes are a service provider you know and what other services people want at the moment yeah great well. so i mean it, it comes from a realization not just within the team but amongst our customers that you're yeah, being part of a box scheme you're you, you're collective purchasing so the basic arrangement is yeah you, know, you aggregate the buying power of that customer base each week go out to market get the best possible you know produce that's available best value etc cetera, etc cetera. and so we've looked at that as as a you know what's the underlying economic model so collective purchasing collective action and then sort of had conversations both within the team but also with a few customers as well try to identify opportunities where that same approach can be applied to different problems that people are facing and so the, the one for us I mean it's also inspired by initiatives like the people powered retrofit and and carbon co-op um, you know, doing some fantastic work. I'm sure there's examples that I, you know, won't know about. But essentially, you know, the it's the cooperative economic approach, you know, where you're bringing individual households together to do things, you know, collectively that they might not otherwise be able to do individually. So, yeah, the the idea to explore the you know solutions to solar PV, home insulation. You know, ground source, air source, heat pumps, and certainly in Sheffield, you know, the housing stock's got a lot of like urban terrace streets uh, that that have a particular sort of set of challenges around retrofit, where you, you know actually it would make a lot more sense to do a, a collection of houses houses together. So in the same way that we enable our customers to aggregate their buying power and buy fruit and veg, let's do the same for for retrofit. Um, so yeah, just exploring because yeah, you know, regather is an economic proposition that arrived at food and drink as the most kind of appropriate sector in which to demonstrate you know what we want to see happen. Um, you know, for us, there are other sectors out there uh, that that are, you know may offer a similar opportunity, and with, you know there are obviously examples of that happening, particularly around like community energy. Uh, and so on. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a, a significant number. So it's just about applying our model in in other sectors um, and, and building on on the brand. I suppose would be the marketeer's way of talking about it. So can I just uh, interrupt with a with a technical point here? The um, the online guys are finding it really hard to hear the questions and contributions from the audience. So if you do ask a question, uh, I think it's probably because uh, you just need to hold the mic a bit closer uh, to your mouth when you speak. Um, but yeah, if you can do that, that would really help the online guys. Yeah, sorry, and I'm not just on that last point. I don't. I mean. It, the nation is, is full of individuals, obviously. Um, and I, I, the way I've just seen the last few months is people here 3,000, 4,000, 6,000 for their heating and their gas. You know, at the end of each month, you need to have a few hundred quid more there than you had at the beginning of the month. And I think once people quite where they're saving it from, I wouldn't think it's strategic. I would think it's, you know, just don't buy that, delay that, buy, that purchase. Um, there is a world when, when money goes quite short, where food actually becomes a bit of a treat for people, um, which is hard to believe because food has been almost free at the point of use for years and you can have it delivered to your door in 20 minutes if you've got a, need an emergency pineapple. All of those things are, are true at the same time that stock of food is tightening and the price of food is going up and getting it to people is going up. These stupid apps, that you know, emergency food apps, they're not going to last. They're backed by city money. I think you pointed it out earlier on. It's going to come back to the people that were there originally providing food. Um, and I hope that people in a month or two's time realise actually it, is, it was never £6,000. It's it's two grand a year for their heating and they have got a few hundred quid left at the end of a month. And they can get through Christmas without you know having to 
scrub too much, but buying food and treating the family to some nice food, a nice piece of meat on Sunday, just like it was. So, you know, you have to go back to the 70s. If you're old enough, this is all very familiar. Um, you know, how people cope and they do it at different stages through the crisis. And, you know, I hope there'll be a moment of calm where people aren't realize they're not quite as badly off as, as they as they thought they might be. And they, they do start to spend a bit more on those little treats like upgrading the food purchase, because that's a very different, you know, it's, it's a tenner well spent, I think, to, to upgrade the food for a family. And I think people will see that, I hope. Question waiting patiently at the back. Um, I'm Dom from Why Organic. Uh, this is quite a practical question. We launched a box scheme in the spring of this year and we're up to about 40 to 50 boxes a week at the moment. So pretty happy with the way it's going, but I'm. we would love to be around double that by Christmas. And I feel that the customers are there in our area in a very practical way. Uh, we've heard a lot about the message to give out, but what practical steps would the panel recommend to get those customers on board. What do you think works best? You know, particularly thinking about non-digital as well as digital, yet yeah, leaflet drops, a stall in town, anything that particularly leaps out or perhaps someone in the audience has an anecdote along those lines. Just to help the panel as well, could you just say a bit about where, you're, where you feel your market is? Uh, well, we're in um, South Herefordshire in the Wye Valley in a, quite a rural location. We have two market towns of around 10,000 people within decent reach. And we also deliver, we find more customers at the moment. In fact, almost all our customers live in the rural surroundings rather than the towns. We would like to crack the towns, ideally. We're nowhere near a big city, so we're talking about market towns as a target potentially. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of yeah. tips. Um, like letterbox drops can work really well if they're done right. And, um, you know, the, the hub that started in Winchester, it, probably a different demographic, uh, but it, it was able to build up to over 50 customers from zero, just purely um, through letterbox drops. So it can work and it can also be it can also not work at all. We, um, the, the main source of new customers that we've identified is word of mouth. So whatever you can do to encourage your existing customers to tell their friends. Um, we've tried things like promo codes where you, you give your customers a code that if they share that with their friends, their friends will get 10 pounds off or five pounds off their first box and they'll get five off their next box. They tend to actually not work that well because people don't like to you know, participate in those sorts of deals to kind of get their friends onto something, but just asking them and just saying, hey, we could really do with some more customers. Can you put the word out there? We really appreciate it. That tends to work well. Um, but then there's also, yeah, obviously you've got your, your tried and tested, your, your social media, your Google ads, things like that. It's not, it's definitely a layering effect, but um, word of mouth, I think, is probably the most tried and true, just ask. I just add, I mean, I, the, um, it's not a, a point about how to grow your customers, but be careful what customers you, you attract. Um, if you go through a fast growth, uh, you know, doubling before Christmas, what happens after Christmas when, you know, if you incentivize customers to join you uh, and then they leave, um, you, you've invested a lot of money uh, for, for no long-term benefit. So think about how many customers you want to attract and, and how long you want to retain them for uh, and, and focus on that as the, as the outcome rather than choosing to double before Christmas because you'll probably lose more than double after Christmas because they'll all tell each other how great it was, um, but now they've got to move on because that was great for Christmas. We are out of our allotted time, so thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you for your attention. Thank you to our panel. Um, and uh, yeah, 10.30, we have a break now before the 11 o'clock sessions. Thank you.